Okay, this is a podcast recorded on behalf of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. My name is Amy Manley and joining me today is Dr June Brown, who is a senior lecturer in clinical psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. And today we're going to be discussing your paper, which is due for publication in January 2014 in the British Journal of Psychiatry, and that's looking at one-day self-confidence workshops using CBT techniques. And so I was hoping you could give us an idea of what led to you developing this project. Yes, I mean, the, the background to this is um, quite interesting in the sense that I was interested in trying to reach members of the general public who had depression. But when we ran depression workshops, um, we found that very few people actually came. And of the people who came, a lot of them were already using services. And we, we just decided that we needed to do something. And what we decided to do was to change the label. Mm. So there's quite a lot of evidence to show that depression is linked to self-esteem. And therefore, we changed the label to self-confidence because that's a much more common mm -hmm. um, term that people use to describe how they feel. Mm -hmm. And when we changed the label to self-confidence, uh, we found that a lot more people came. Mm -hmm. um, and for the first um, series of self-confidence workshops, we actually had to close the list early mm -hmm. because so many people were, were interested. Mm -hmm. So clearly the workshops were very popular um, with the members of the public. Mm. I wonder why is it that you chose um, this way of delivering psychological therapy? I mean, essentially, I wanted to develop an accessible mm -hmm. intervention and I wanted to run one-day workshops because people, if they go on courses, they usually just go for the day. They don't usually go for weekly sessions. Um, and the other part of all this was that we wanted to run the workshops at the weekend when people mm. would have time. Mm. Um, and we also wanted to run the workshops in a non-mental health setting. Mm. So we chose either leisure centres or community centres or, or libraries mm. in which to run them so that, that people wouldn't feel stigmatised mm. about, um, about these workshops. And then we also invited people to self-refer so mm. that they could come directly mm. to the workshops. Mm. So can you just tell us a bit about how you went about evaluating the success of these workshops. So what we did was we invited people who were interested to come to introductory talks mm -hmm. um, where we told them a bit more about what the workshops involved because mm -hmm. obviously this is a new kind of format. Mm -hmm. um, and we also asked people if they were interested in participating in the study mm -hmm. and if they were then we asked them to fill in the assessment forms. And then we divided people into two groups randomly. Mm -hmm. So half of them went into the experimental group, which meant essentially they received the workshop very soon after the introductory talks. And the other half, we offered them the workshops, but three months after. Mm -hmm. So at the three month point, we asked the experimental group to come back again to fill in the forms mm. and we also invited the control group people to come along um, and asked them to fill in the forms before the workshop mm. so we could compare the two groups mm. um, as far as we could essentially and we found quite big differences between mm. the two. Mm. So one of the main outcomes of your study was um, looking at depression and changing depression scores. How did you determine at the outset that this population who had self-referred actually had clinically significant depression symptoms? We asked the participants to fill in the BDI, mm -hmm. um, which is the Back Depression Inventory, and we used a cutoff of 14. Mm -hmm. So anybody who scored 14 or over mm -hmm. would be classified as having depression. Mm -hmm. So we were quite keen to um, specifically offer the intervention in the trial had um, depression. Mm. Mm. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you found. I mean, what we found was that the people who did receive the workshop mm. immediately um, did improve quite a lot in terms mm. of their depression.
depression scores mm -hmm. and use the PGI in this um, particular study. Mm -hmm. um, so the control group um, participants, they did, didn't change that much mm -hmm. um, in comparison to the experimental group. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the difference was obviously very significant mm -hmm. and um, very, very pleasing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that one of the benefits of delivering psychological therapies in this way was the accessibility. Mm. So how did you measure that? But there were two things. One was we were very interested in the people who hadn't consulted their mm. GPs mm. Um, for their depression. Mm. Um, because we know that a lot of people don't go to their GPs with mm. their mental health problems. It's not about 30% who actually go. So that was a major um, thing that we were interested in, and we found that um, about a quarter hadn't consulted their GPs. Mm -hmm. And the other um, aspect that we were interested in was how many people from black and ethnic minorities actually came. Mm -hmm. And we were surprised by how many people who were black Africans, black Caribbeans, as well as Asian, actually mm -hmm. came to the workshops. Mm -hmm. And somehow it just felt like they were more able mm -hmm. to access the, the workshops, even though generally they don't access the, mm -hmm. the specialist services. Mm -hmm. So again, it was quite a surprising but very positive result mm -hmm. that we, we found. Mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts about why that was overcome by these one-day workshops? Um, so I think it's the perception of the problem mm -hmm. that can be very important. And so once we can offer a self-referral group, which means that people don't need to go to their GPs, mm -hmm. And we're offering an intervention that is using different words to mm. the psychiatric labels that we normally use. Mm. Then I think that allows more people to. Mm. You know, I, I think that's that's the combination that was really quite helpful in this. Mm. Mm. And I wonder what implications that actually has for services as they're provided at the moment. Do you see this actually having a place in current? Well, I'd certainly like to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what um, has happened is that the self-referral group is something that the present IAP services actually use, mm -hmm. and I think the, the work that we've been doing has maybe contributed to that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's been mm -hmm. the only thing, but it has contributed to that. Um, and after the trial, I did do some training of IAP um, mm -hmm. therapists, and so so some IAP services are now running mm. these workshops. In the longer term, what I'd like to also do is run a larger trial, mm. because this trial was very much based around um, areas in South London. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to run a larger trial um, in different parts of the UK mm. to see whether or not this kind of intervention can mm. be effective. Mm. And if it can be effective, then it can be rolled out um, mm. in, in, a, in, a, in a clearer way, I think. Mm. Okay. Well, it sounds like that you've got quite a lot of work on your hands still going forward from um, the findings of this project, but mm. certainly that there are very they are very compelling findings and um, those that have the potential to really influence service provision and how people access psychological services. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. I do appreciate you recording this podcast. And um, just to reiterate that your paper will obviously be available in the British Journal of Psychiatry mm -hmm. um, January 2014 edition. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you.